So I believe we are live. So welcome to the Quant University Spring School Sessions. And uh, to kick us off, uh, we have uh, Andreas Scott and Lucas Rosenblatt from Microsoft. Uh, they've been working on some really cool projects and uh, this whole area of differential privacy and machine learning is becoming extremely important, especially in regulated industries like healthcare, finance, government, wherein uh, data security is extremely important. And the last few weeks, I've been hearing a lot of discussions wherein people have been you know, pivoting from focusing primarily on the model to looking at the data and looking at how to make the whole pipeline for processing the data more robust. That way, as we productionize more, more and more machine learning applications, uh, we can think about the ways in which, especially if the data cannot uh, leave the the source or the place where it was originally generated and also aspects about how much transparency we need to bring in into the whole machine learning workflow uh, to make data uh, more and more important as a part of the puzzle. So welcome Andres and welcome Lucas. And um, uh, for people who are joining in, uh, welcome again. So I would love to kind of start out with our, our regular way in which we start out the session. So if you would take a minute and put it in the chat window where you're joining in from. I'd very much appreciate that. So just take a minute and type in where you're joining in from. Um, I can say Boston. Um, so we have Boston, we have Atlanta, um, many people from Boston, Baltimore, Montreal, um, Hamburg, <laughs> uh, well, San Jose, Toronto. Yeah, nice, nice to see uh, people from various places joining in. So welcome again. And um, before I hand over the stage to uh, Andres and Lucas, uh, just to let you know a couple of logistics, I'm going to uh, make the slides and the video of today's session available on Q Academy afterwards for people who are uh, registered. So uh, if you have not registered to QO.academy, uh, please uh, create a login and register. You'll have access to uh, today's session and also all the prior sessions and the slides we have been uh, you know, collecting and putting on the platform. So as uh, we discussed uh, briefly earlier, so today's session is gonna be a 90 minute session. We are gonna have um, Andreas and Lucas uh, talk about the whole framework about smart noise and uh, differential privacy. Uh, for people who are new to the Quant University world, so welcome. So we've been hosting uh, the Quant University Spring School. And as a part of uh, the Spring School, we have uh, invited eminent speakers and uh, researchers from various institutions throughout the world. Uh, so in today's session, we are going to be having the session from Microsoft. Next week, uh, we have Nick Schmidt, Patrick Hall, August Sugianto, and Tulsi. Uh, so they come from a diverse perspective. So uh, Nick and Patrick, they primarily focus on responsible AI-related topics, both from a legal and a policy perspective. August, as most of you would know, is at Wells Fargo. He heads uh, risk management efforts there. And Tulsi is at uh, Google, so she works on the responsible AI side of things. And uh, in uh, April 27th, we have a session on monitoring machine learning applications by Elena and Emily from evidently.ai. And they are based out of Germany and uh, St. Petersburg, Russia. So uh, I'm looking forward to that session. And after that, uh, Oge Dyke uh, from ThoughtWorks. So he's been uh, working on this uh, explainability dashboard and he's gonna be presenting on a a session on how to make uh, models explainable. So if you're interested in explainability and you're looking forward to some open source tooling on explainability dashboard, so that's the session you would like to attend. And then um, on May 11th, uh, Jacopo Tagliubo, he's, uh, he's actually currently in um, Italy and Oge is in the Netherlands. So we have a whole diverse set of speakers from various parts of the world uh, coming to the uh, Quant University Spring School session. So he actually, um, has a whole uh, session on serverless data ops, and um, I'm really looking forward to that session. Too. And please look uh, look out for uh, the rest of the sessions in the se in the season, which is going to come out soon. Um, I also want to uh, quickly, uh, you know, talk about today's session. Um, as you all know, uh, 
we have been hosting these sessions since summer of uh, uh, 2020, since uh, COVID hit. And most of you know that Quant University we based out of Mass Boston, Massachusetts. And uh, we used to do a lot of um, um, live sessions at various parts of the world. And since COVID hit, we have been taking all these sessions online. And uh, we have had more than 10,000 people attend various sessions since uh, uh, summer of uh, 2000. And we are now launching the, the Spring School and we have a bunch of different courses. We have partnered with Premier. And if you're interested in any of the courses, just go to the Premier website or go to our website and you should be able to uh, see all these courses. Um, there's also a whole certificate program if you're interested in learning or taking a self-study course in machine learning, primarily focused on finance and uh, associated with model risk concepts. And the two courses, which I'm extremely happy uh, and we're going, uh, in the first cohort is the algorithmic auditing course and uh, another course on risk and machine learning models. So these two courses of the first cohort, uh, we have had people from 11 countries join us and also from various organizations like Ernst & Young, um, uh, from uh, CIBC, from ING, uh, from uh, Sconfield, a lot of different companies have taken this course. And we have people from South Africa, from Singapore, from India taking these courses. So the second cohort is going to start uh, end of May. So if you're interested, please take a look at our website and you'll have more information there. Okay, so today's session, without further ado, will be, uh, uh, will be uh, uh, delivered by Andreas and Lucas. So Lucas, Andreas, welcome again. Thank you so much for spending your time uh, in the afternoon and also late evening, Andreas, for you, uh, for joining us in this session. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the slides will be on, uh, sorry, just a second, let me just remove my notifications. Um, will be available on Q.R. Academy for people who are joining in. So without further ado, please take it away, Andreas. I'm gonna uh, enable you to. So Andreas, are you gonna be starting the session? Okay, so I'm gonna make you the presenter. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you should be able to share your screen, Andreas. Yeah, <clears throat> on it. So can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Perfect. Oops, sorry. Okay, so first of all, thank you so much for having us. Really excited to be here. Maybe a quick introduction about ourselves. So my name is Andreas Kopp. I'm um, actually um, working in the Microsoft Consulting Organization. The role is digital advisor, which is actually a kind of a generalist role. So I'm providing strategic advice typically to executives of our enterprise customers, so really the large enterprises in Germany. Um, many digital advisors have one specific topic, and in my case, that's AI, and um, in particular, responsible AI, and also the um, tooling in this context. And differential privacy is one technology which we uh, position there within the overall framework of responsible AI and the, the two links. Yeah, so far about myself, uh, Lucas. Yeah, and I am a machine learning engineer on Microsoft's AI development acceleration program team. Um, so that's a rotational program. And, you know, it's also sort of a generalist role, but specifically focusing on machine learning across the company. And I found myself focusing on responsible AI as well. So that's how I find myself here. Great. So what we've um, prepared um, is three parts. First, uh, we want to briefly talk about over uh, um, about our responsible AI framework and how we position things like smart noise, so the differential privacy product uh, Microsoft is working on together with Harvard and the OpenDV initiative. Then uh, we talk a little bit more about the differential privacy background, so really giving an intuition what it is. So this session does not assume any background knowledge uh, when it comes to differential privacy. And then we um, dive deeper into a couple of use cases for analytics and also 
machine learning. So we have, I think, two to three demos uh, included. So it's not only slides, but you also can see the concept in action. Yeah, and with that, I would say, let's get started talking about the bigger framework. As I already mentioned, Microsoft is positioning um, differential privacy um, as other topics within the broader context of responsible AI, even though we clearly understand that differential privacy uh, also goes beyond use cases. You have uh, classical statistical use cases, which are not necessarily related to AI, but that's the, the way we, we frame things. Overall, we have six responsible AI principles, which are important for our product development in general, but also for the way how we work together with customers. So for, for example, every project that we are doing, and this is what I um, um, experience every day, there is also a kind of, of monitoring of projects if we are engaging with customers and there are potentially sensitive uses related to AI. Uh, this has to be uh, uh, proved by, by a, a particular board to ensure that these principle, uh, these AI principles, these responsible AI principles are all also followed, not only within the product development, but also in our customer engagements. Yeah, and we have these six principles. I think if you look at them, all make sense. Um, probably everybody would agree. Yeah, fairness makes sense. Uh, AI systems have to be reliable and safe and uh, also uh, privacy preserving and secure. So on, on that high level, everything is fine. The question always is, what can customers do to set this, these principles into action? What, what are you doing with that? And we have um, a kind of uh, frameworks which help to approach, uh, to realize those uh, principles and projects like a kind of harms assessment really to identify what are the stakeholders of, uh, for an upcoming AI solution. Um, maybe also including stakeholders or affected people we did not think about at first, and then find out is there potential harm to these people and what can we do to minimize um, harm. So this is more the, the, the framework part, the organizational part, but then there is also a tool set part really. Um, looking into models, for example, to, to understand how they, how they behave. And we structure the tool set into three buckets. One is understand. This is about explainability, interpretability. So really um, providing glass box models, but also providing black box explainers to really understand the behavior of models overall, but also understand how, what was the driver um, behind a specific prediction. Then there is a new tool which has been released uh, just a couple of weeks ago, the error analysis tool, which helps you to identify specific um, error behavior within specific cohorts in your data set. So maybe you look at the classification report, uh, overall everything looks good, but then you find out that for a specific cohort, for example, for uh, uh, women of a specific age, the model does behave um, significantly um, uh, worse than, than overall. And then we have things like fair learn, which is about identifying bias and also mitigating bias uh, within machine learning models. And in the context of protect, which is the second um, pillar, we have um, capabilities like confidential machine learning, but also differential privacy, which is the topic of today's uh, talk. And uh, when it comes to control, this is more the, the process part. So how do you um, manage your data sets? How do you manage your experiments and also your models so that you find out, um, let's say uh, 10 months after your model is in production, well, how is, uh, uh, is this model? How was it trained? Which were the hyperparameters? Which were the data sets? This is more supporting the overall uh, machine learning life cycles. All of these tools are um, open source. So there is a clear strategy to, to um, provide them as open source tools first, but also to integrate them in the um, uh, Azure machine learning um, platform so that they are can be used uh, from, uh, from Azure. 
And yeah, when it comes to privacy, I don't think that we need a deep dive discussion why this is relevant. If you look at various headlines um, in the last couple of years or in the last couple of months, it's it, it's a big issue. There, there are so many data leaks. On the one hand, um, data is extremely valuable for progress, for research, for society. If we look at the insights we get uh, COVID related, for example, it's, it's extremely valuable. On the other hand, there is a big risk to the individual because we provide more and more data about uh, ourselves and various um, networks and pub, uh, various social networks. And what we find out is that it's relatively easy for adversaries to combine data sets to really learn things about you that are sensitive, that are private, that you don't want anyone else um, to, to be uh, uh, known about you. So it's a, it's a big topic. And this is why differential privacy, uh, which is considered as the new or the upcoming gold standard for privacy protection is such an important topic. Uh, we already mentioned that the, um, the product uh, which we provide to the open source is called Smart Noise. Um, it had been released in the, its first version at the Build Conference last year under the name White Noise, had been uh, re renamed to Smart Noise. And the idea really is uh, in this collaboration with the Harvard University to have an end-to-end -end system for practitioners um, who are not experts in implementing these kind of algorithms to use differential privacy re relatively easily for, for practitioners. But it is also part of a broader initiative uh, um, launched by Harvard, which is called Open Differential Privacy, which is more the community um, activity to really um, bring a differential privacy forward for, for the whole community also, in, including different uh, research uh, entities. And the, the concrete product that uh, Hubbard and Microsoft are working on is called uh, Smart Noise. And the way it's working is relatively simple. So you have your original data set here on the uh, right-hand side. This is the, um, let's say, original unprotected data, uh, which includes a lot of um, data points about individuals. And then you have on the other side, you have the user, a kind of analyst who wants to access data, wants to get information about overall um, patterns within the data set, but we do not want to provide too specific information about individuals. So we provide the user the way to submit a query. Um, it's executed in the background. Then we um, add some statistical noise to the data and provide, let's say, statistical aggregate uh, um, um, results like uh, uh, like counts, uh, averages, histograms, or or whatever, so that the analyst can uh, can get his uh, or her. Uh, query back or the, the information that he or she is interested in. And the way how it works, um, we will, um, um, how, the, how the data is protected, this is something that we will describe in more detail in this uh, webinar and also show it in action. So really the, the main idea um, for those of you who have not worked with the term differential privacy before is that we want to provide information about a big picture like a statistical analysis or machine learning. So we want to, for example, learn about the um, statistical correlation between age and the impact of a COVID infection, but we are not interested in specific data points. For example, we are not interested of the specific medical condition of John Doe who agreed to participate in our study. But what we want to do is we want to provide John with a um, measurable guarantee that his data uh, will not be, be leaked. So he can uh, with confidence participate in our study. That, that's the main idea of, from, uh, of differential privacy. And how are we doing that? We are adding carefully tuned random noise to the data um, and to computations so that the contribution of John, so his individual data point is masked, but the overall big picture is preserved. That's basically the idea of differential privacy. And 
maybe you would argue, well, what, what's the problem? We have this problem today, it's solved. We are working with anonymized data. That's the current practice to um, protect um, personal data um, in, in many, many uh, cases. And the problem is with anonymized data that it is vulnerable to a privacy attack. So you can not really protect data by anonymization or pseudonymization. So here are some uh, quite prominent examples who show um, that uh, anonymous data is really uh, at risk uh, of um, being re-identified by uh, privacy attacks. Um, for example, uh, Netflix held an open competition a couple of years ago in order to improve their movie rating algorithm. So they provided an anonymized version of their movie rating data set to the public. So really no information what we typically would consider as PII um, had been included, but it took only, I think a couple of months until researchers were able to re-identify the people um, behind the uh, recommendations, behind the ratings by name, by simply linking um, the ratings with the um, internet movie DB. So uh, this kind of linkage attack was not based on typical PII information like, like a, a name, gender, age, or something like that. The, the actual key was the ratings themselves. And they were able to re-identify uh, quite a uh, large fraction of the uh, people re represented in the data set. That was a kind of research project. There's also a paper, but um, the example on the right-hand side is an actual attack. I think many of you probably know the good old New York taxi data set. It also does not include uh, information that we would typically consider as PII. The only information related to the passengers is the number of passengers in the data set, but, but that's it. And what adversaries were able to leverage was the GPS information. So the start location, for example, they just linked that with information from gossip websites um, to identify VIPs, celebrities, um, the rights of those people um, to um, find out um, what was the destination address of the celebrity? How much did they pay? Uh, how much did they tip, et cetera? And, and that was a, is a real world attack. And the uh, dilemma is summarized by the uh, work by, by Cynthia Dwork from Microsoft Research, who's one of the inventors of differential privacy, that she said anonymized data isn't. So either the data um, is not anonymous because you can still identify people. Um, if you really want to ensure that um, nobody can be identified, you would have to remove so much information from the data that it's no longer useful. That, that, that's the basic dilemma of data anonymization. And the idea of differential privacy, so shout out to the um, Facebook high torch people for providing this example is really um, to, if, if you look at all these data points, you can see, you can identify there are faces, there are flowers, for example. And what we are typically doing when we are machine, when we do machine learning or statistical analysis, we are not interested, as I said, in those data points. We want to see the big picture, which is, which is the painting of Mona Lisa in this case. So, and the idea is if we go back to the individual data points, what differential privacy does, it blurs the individual data points. So the individual contribution of the people, but the big picture, the painting is essentially the same. And this is what we are interested in. So, and, and that's basically the idea. I think it's a nice illustration to give an intuition about the idea of differential privacy. Of course, there is also a formal, a strict mathematical um, definition. And here's another way uh, to talk about this. Um, for example, if you consider that uh, we have an individual, Benjamin, for example, so Benjamin is willing in general, so he wants to support medical progress. So he wants to participate in a medical study. 
But on the other hand, he is concerned what could happen if his data point uh, or his data, his uh, record uh, gets into the wrong hands. And probably the perfect uh, guarantee that we would give Benjamin is that we say we, we look at it at, at a risk or at a from a harms perspective that we say, well, there are two scenarios. One is uh, the study, including your data point. Uh, and then there is the opt out option. So the same data set, um, the only difference between data set A and data set B is that Benjamin record is not included or, or maybe replaced by another record. And, and this is uh, uh, the, the, the core principle of differential privacy also where the name differential privacy comes from that we compare the scenario of the database including his record with the scenario of uh, the database excluding his record. And the promise of differential privacy is that the risk of da data leakage um, is essentially the same. I'm saying essentially it's not 100% the same. There is a tuning knob, which is called epsilon. That This is the amount of noise which we can use to control um, the data, um, the privacy level, and also to control the remaining risk that something good uh, could go wrong. But for practical applications, the, the guarantee to Benjamin is that even though he participates, if we apply differential privacy, um, the risk is essentially the same as in the opt-out scenario. And yeah, maybe to, to give uh, an idea how it works in practice. So how we can apply um, random noise, carefully tuned random noise to, to the data. Here's a practical example, which is a little bit older than the differential privacy concept, which is called randomized response. So consider a situation where we want to um, ask a, a, a community or a population a, extremely sensitive question, like we want to find out about tax compliance within a, within a population. So it's clear that you will probably not get um, uh, honest answers in many, many cases, especially not from the tax evaders in, in such a setting. So what can we do to ensure that on the one hand, we get uh, reliable answers, but also that we protect the privacy even of the tax evaders, even in a situation where the tax investigation uh, seizes all uh, the, the records and including the names. And the answer is we leverage randomness. So uh, it's a very simple experiment or a, a, a relatively simple setup used in, in randomized response, I think th since the uh, 1960s, um, and it, it's, it's relatively straightforward. So we ask the participant to do a hidden coin toss, so we do not see what the result of this um, coin flip is. If the result is tails, um, um, the participant is asked to give a true answer. If the uh, result of the coin flip is heads, um, we ask the participant to flip the coin for a second time and make um, his or her answer dependent on the result of the coin flip. So it's pure, pure random. And so, and everybody um, is, um, um, is happy with this setup and follows the rules. Then um, one thing is that we can guarantee to the participants um, is that they have plausible deniability. So even in, in the case that um, all those records, including their names, uh, is seized by the tax investigation, everybody has plausible deniability because they can say, can argue, well, I had to give this answer because of the, uh, the way the experiment worked. So it is a random answer. But on the other hand, we can calculate the actual tax compliance um, of the population. So if, for example, 34% answer with yes, based on the experiment, uh, we can calculate the percentage of actual tax invaded, which is 18% uh, in this case. Of course, in today's differential privacy settings, we are not flipping coins. So uh, the noise is added uh, automatically. If you consider, for example, 
Windows 10, if we collect uh, uh, diagnostic data from the end user devices, uh, we apply diff uh, random noise, uh, differentially private noise before the data is transmitted to Microsoft then for analysis. And the same thing is true for Google and also for Apple um, end user devices. So they are leveraging the same uh, concept, which is differential, the local differential privacy model on the end user devices. And yeah, um, as, as I mentioned, um, differential privacy is not a binary switch. Um, so there is a very important tuning knob, which is called privacy parameter epsilon or privacy loss parameter, which you can use to work on this trade off between privacy protection, you can make it extremely strong um, and accuracy. And this is shown here in this picture. For example, if um, the epsilon value is extremely high, which means that the noise is relatively low on the right hand side, you have the maybe the original picture. So it's very clear, you can uh, still identify people. Um, if I move the privacy parameter to the, to the center, then the picture becomes a little bit blurry. So maybe I can still recognize the gender, but it's obviously not as clear as the original picture. And I move to the far left, then it maybe becomes hard to even count people. So we are always operating on a trade-off between accuracy and the privacy guarantee if you are using differential privacy. And yeah, differential privacy supports a broad spectrum of applications, um, which is also the um, included in our talk here. So we show a couple of, let's say, classical statistical examples like simple counts, averages, histograms, looking at distributions. Then you have more complex applications like multivariate analysis, like regression, clustering, classification. Another interesting use case, and uh, Lucas will talk more about that, is really to generate the generation of synthetic data. So you can uh, look at an original data set and uh, leverage differential privacy to create a new synthetic version of the uh, data set, which satisfied differential privacy, uh, which you then uh, hand out to the community and uh, guarantee that the uh, privacy of the uh, individuals represented in the original data set is preserved. And you can also, and we will show demos on that, um, leverage uh, differential privacy for machine learning, let's say for classical machine learning use cases like random forest, um, uh, logistic regression, uh, and these kind of things. But you can also apply it to deep learning. So um, all major deep learning frameworks like uh, TensorFlow and PyTorch also have additions for differential privacy. And we will uh, show examples uh, with PyTorch for medical uh, images in, in this webinar. And the problem with differential privacy, at, at least from my perspective, as um, not being a scientist, being more a practitioner, is that there is a lot of, there's a really strong scientific foundation, a lot of research papers, but for let's say uh, data scientists or machine learning practitioners, it's, it's not so easy to understand the concept. And uh, what we did with the help of Lucas and other folks is really to, um, uh, to, to come up with a white paper, quite comprehensive white paper, which is focused on uh, for practitioners really to understand the concept, to make it very tangible, very practical. Um, and it also includes, six demo notebooks, uh, which you can use. Um, they are all public. Uh, we will show a couple of them in, in this webinar, really to, to better understand the concept, to play with the concept, and also apply them to your own use cases. And what we are going to show in this webinar is uh, how differential privacy can, do, can be used uh, to protect against re-identification attacks. Uh, we also um, look at the impact on uh, various epsilon values and um, the number of data points. Uh, we will 
also take a look at um, uh, doing uh, machine learning with a synthetic data set. And the final demo will be a deep learning uh, scenario to uh, um, detecting pneumonia and X-ray images, comparing the non-private and the differential private version. And that brings me to my first demo. So now we are moving to the differential privacy analytics and machine learning use cases really to, to, to understand on the one hand, the risk of uh, classical privacy um, protection methods like anonymization and to compare that with differential privacy. So let's assume we are hospital representatives. So we have a lot of patient data and we want to provide this data to a research institution to, um, uh, to benefit uh, medical research. Um, so, and we have information, of course, we have, as the uh, hospital representatives, we, we have the full uh, data set. We have the names of the patients. We have demo, basic dif demographic information, but also the extremely sensitive information like diagnosis, the, the treatments that we did, and also the medical outcome. So what we did in this demo, we generated 30,000 uh, records, of course, all synthetic random data, so no, no real uh, 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 data about real people, of course. And what we compare in this demo is uh, data anonymization. Um, so we uh, reduct uh, information we cause in the data. So if we remove the names, for example. So ages are only shown in, in decades and we take away uh, uh, three digits of the zip code. Uh, we also ensure that for each demographic um, combination of attributes, at least three records exist. So this uh, data anonymization satisfies uh, uh, K of three anonymization. Um, and on the other hand, we uh, generate a new data set uh, based on the original data set, which satisfies differential privacy using the smart noise product. And Lucas is going to show a little bit more background how this works. And for comparison, we, on the other hand, we have an uh, adversary, we have an attacker who has some information, some very basic information like phone book information. So he has a real large data set about names, um, uh, age, gender, and, and also zip codes. Um, this is really a toy example. In, in the real world, attackers would be able to leverage much more information and it becomes really critical if they are able to combine various data sets to do much more sophisticated uh, attacks uh, based on, on, on triangulation, for example. So what, we, what you see here is really, it, it's a toy example, but uh, already disturbing. So maybe a small spoiler. So, and what we are doing in this, in the, in the notebook, I'm showing it here uh, because it uh, takes uh, roughly 10 minutes in the notebook is we try to combine the attacker's data set with the data set, which is protected by anonymization. So it's, it's two phases. One is simply to match the information. And then uh, as we do a second pass. Um, we uh, have uh, included an, a specific UID to be able to really um, find out how many um, uh, records could really be identified. So to, uh, to, uh, to be able to exclude false positives in this example. So, and what we can see here is that, that that's the result. So we were able to re-identify almost a third of all identities based on animization. And, and that's uh, kind of uh, to expect based on this K of three uh, anonymization that we have used. And you can see here um, the what we were able to re-identify. Just, just a couple of examples. As I mentioned, all random data. So no, no real people represented here, of course. But um, I think this really shows the problem of current data anonymization strategies. You can argue, yeah, in a real case, we would not use three anonymization. We would maybe use 10 anonymization. Th that's all fine. But on the other hand, uh, real world attackers would be also able to leverage much more sophisticated algorithms and much more um, uh, uh, additional data which they can link. So this is a real 
a real problem, which is shown only uh, already by this toy example. And what we are doing on the on the other hand for comparison is we uh, leverage smart noise to generate a new data set based on the original data set, which has the same statistical properties as the original data set. And since there's not much to see here, we spiced up the, um, the animation a little bit and the result is then here. So in, in this particular example, we were able to protect all identities. So not a single um, identity could be uh, re-identified uh, by this attack. So uh, which shows the differential privacy is, um, provides a, a strong protection mechanism here for those who are interested. Uh, we are using a specific uh, synthesizer, the MBAM synthesizer. Maybe uh, Lucas has some time to, to discuss it um, in his part about the synthesizers. We used an epsilon of three, which is a uh, common um, starting point for practical use cases. Of course, the question you might ask is, well, that's nice. Uh, we, um, we've masked the contribution of the individuals, so we added noise to the data, fine, but has the data still utility for statistical analysis? At the end of the day, you know, we want to see the big picture, we want to do analysis. And what we, we are seeing here is, is, is a very simple univariate use case. So what we compare is, uh, the distribution of the diagnostic code. So the left one, the blue one, is the original um, distribution. And the orange one is the same distribution, so the same uh, feature based on the synthetic data set. And what you can see here, um, there are some differences in the histogram, but it's, it's quite it's, it's, it's quite consistent. So there is uh, still utility in the data. You can still use it for statistical analysis. But the question is, well, what, what, what's the error? And in order to find out, to get a better uh, feeling for that uh, about the error, and if you can compensate for the error introduced by the noise, we have a separate notebook. So what we are doing here is we also compare distributions at various data set sizes um, based on the uh, California uh, income distribution um, data set. And we compare the original value from the original sample with differential private histograms at three different protection levels. So the yellow one uses an epsilon of 0.5, the reddish one uses 0 0.1 and the dark one uses 0 0.05, which, which is an extremely uh, high level of protection in, for, for practical use cases. And here, what you can see is based on an overall data set of 10,000 records. So the error, the percentage deviation goes depending on the level of protection from 0 0.3 up to four. And you can also spot um, especially for the um, dark um, bars, that there, there are some uh, deviations which you can see. And then if we go to 50K um, records, uh, things look a little bit different. So uh, even in the case of the strongest protection, it's the deviation is below 1%. And if we increase the data even further, then it, it's hard to, to spot differences between, between the bars and the um, uh, error even in the most aggressive scenario is 0.3%. So in, in a general, that's a general um, observation for all use cases, you can compensate for the um, uh, loss and utility that you get by in, the in introduction of noise by adding more data. That, that's a common observation also for other use cases, also for machine learning and also for deep learning, which is an uh, important property. So yeah, maybe now moving to um, machine learning use cases, differentially private machine learning use cases. So we are um, always interested if we are doing machine learning also, um, uh, besides the, the privacy discussion, we 
do not want to uh, that our uh, machine learning models memorize data points. So we want to learn the, the general thing, the general pattern. But um, as you all know, um, um, all um, or many machine learning models have a tendency to, to, uh, to overfit, to, to memorize uh, specific data points. In particular, deep learning that also happens if you are controlling for overfitting. So there's always the tendency to memorize data points, especially very specific data points. And the risk of course is that uh, this enables a, a, a set of attacks. Uh, one is called membership inference attack so that you're able to find out if a specific individual is represented in the data set or not. And this, this alone could be a privacy issue. For example, uh, let's assume we have a medical study about Alzheimer's disease. If you can find out that the specific person was is part of the data set, you can uh, uh, with certain certainty conclude that this uh, person suffers from Alzheimer's. So this is called membership inference attack. And Given this, this large neural networks that we are using, think about GPT-3 with this uh, 175 billion parameters, that, that's a real problem. And that uh, happens uh, also if you are able to control for overfitting because this tendency to memorize data points always exists. And there's another uh, risk which is called model inversion attack. So it's actually possible that's also uh, uh, the result of, of, of research of a research study to reproduce a recognizable image of an, a classifier. So that's a facial recognition model. So that's not any kind of um, generative model. It's really, it's a classifier and researchers were able to reproduce, uh, let's say at least recognizable image of the training uh, data based on this classifier and on this facial recognition model. So this is why um, differential privacy in let's say classical machine learning, but also in particular in deep learning makes a lot of sense. And the question then is um, how can we apply differential privacy uh, with machine learning. And there are various steps uh, within the machine learning, learning workflow that we can use. And these are four options. Of course, um, these are alternative options. So one would be, which is called the local uh, differential privacy model is to add noise during data collection. This is the, uh, the, the Windows 10 example um, uh, of local differential privacy that, that I gave. So um, you, um, the local device acquires data about you or about your behavior or about the device itself, like uh, in the Windows 10 diagnostic data, locally adds noise to the data and then uh, transmits the, uh, the, the noisy data to, to Microsoft or to Google or to Apple for further analysis. So that, that's one option. Of course, from a privacy point of view, that's the preferred option because nobody but the affected individual ever sees the unprotected data. Um, then there is a second option, uh, which um, Lucas is going to talk about, which is that you basically, uh, you have a data set and you reproduce a, a differential private version of this data set. And then you're feeding this into your uh, machine learning workflow as training and, and test data, for, for example. Um, the third option would be to leverage uh, a differential privacy enabled algorithm. So for example, there are uh, for the classic machine learning algorithms um, like uh, logistic regression or naive base, there are differential private uh, versions uh, from uh, IBM, so from the IBM diff prip library. Um, and also for deep learning use cases, both TensorFlow and also PyTorch have um, uh, uh, differential privacy uh, enabled uh, um, uh, st stochastic gradient descent algorithms, learning algorithms, um, that's also possible. And then um, the an, another option would be to um, yeah, combine differential privacy with uh, federated 
learning. So you do uh, your differential privacy locally, do your training locally, and then you just use the aggregated um, uh, parameters, um, the local uh, parameters to aggregate it to your machine learning model. And the basic could also be a differential uh, privacy way of data collection. So there are a couple, couple of um, options. In particular, um, federated learning is, is uh, typically or often combined with differential privacy. So the, they address uh, different concerns or different uh, use cases. So it's uh, uh, quite common in uh, medical use cases or quite a trend to combine these uh, the technologies. So a couple of options and um, Lucas is going to show um, uh, a demo and, and also comparing as a, a particular option two with option number three. And with that, um, I would like to hand it over to uh, Lucas to uh, explain the background of synthetic noise, uh, synthetic data set, sorry, and also to show the demo. Uh, yeah, thanks thank you so much, much. Andres. Um, yeah. uh, quick question. Uh, do, you, do you think we should answer some of the questions we've been seeing in the chat window before Lucas starts his demo? Um, I think we had a couple of questions, but I actually had a question. For all the four steps, uh, do we have sample templates or anything, um, Andres? I know Lucas is going to share two of them, but the other two, do you have templates? Uh, we have um, templates for two and three. Two and three. Okay. So not, not one and four. Okay, okay, good. And um, I think, uh, Lucas, you were able to answer some of the questions. Yeah, I think I got through a couple of them. <laughs> okay. Do you want to go through them? Or, uh, um, I mean, like, um, uh, I don't know how many people were watching the chat window. Um, are there any questions we can answer? Uh, yeah, let me just I briefly know. touch on, um, so one of the questions is um, related to how do you decide on the appropriate value of epsilon? Um, that's a great question. It's almost um, an open research question, essentially. Um, there are certainly um, scenarios where you need to ensure a specific level of privacy based on a specific attack you're defending against. And so you can simply tune your epsilon based on the attack. Um, but generally there is not an agreed upon way for um, deciding on an appropriate level of epsilon. However, there are some um, you know, values like Andres was saying like three, one, or values below one that are agreed upon in literature certainly values above, above that start to get a little dicey. Um, so you don't, you don't usually see values more than 50 or 100 in literature and in their tests. And um, from there, you start to lose any of the privacy and uh, benefits. Yeah. Um, and then maybe I can just start on my part of the presentation and we can get Absolutely. to some of these other Absolutely. questions a little later. Yeah, this is very engaging. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Thanks again, Andreas. That was a very excellent overview. Thank you. Uh, so let me present this. I'll just present with the um, presentation mode off. Okay, so thanks again, Andres, for all that information. I'm just gonna examine one of the downstream applications for differentially private uh, synthesizers specifically. Um, that is to generate a synthetic data set for model training. Um, so synthetic data generation as a broad overview involves taking the original data set and um, training a synthesizer and using the synthesizer to produce um, sort of as much synthetic data as is required to, um, to train the model. And these synthesizers can take many forms. So there's like histogram-based methods um, like MWEM, which Andreas mentioned before. And there are also um, generative adversarial network methods like DPC TGAN or PIDC TGAN, which we have up on smart noise. Um, and I'll just refer to these as GANs. Um, uh, so, that's sort of a broad overview. Um, and now that um, I brought up synthetic data, just make sure everybody's on the same page. Um, 
but simply it's it's you know taking some original data set and um, creating a new data set that mimics the distribution of the original data. Um, so you can see an example of that here. Um, we have our original data set on the left, study data set on the right. You can see that the general distribution with some variation um, is mimicked. Okay, so um, using difference between private synthetic data when training models has some added benefits when compared to what I'll call direct learning, um, where that's just training a different private model on the original data. Um, so when you use a synthetic data set that is different, differentially private, you can sort of train whatever model you want on the data, um, perform your hypergrammar tuning safely, share the model and the data widely. Um, and there's even some evidence that um, this process can create a more robust model, so it could reduce overfitting. Um, whereas direct learning, um, where you uh, actually apply the noise directly during model training, um, is often faster and utilizes the privacy budget well. However, um, once you've sort of trained your model, it's one shot. And so um, it's, you, you can't really do hyperhermetic tuning without reducing your privacy guarantees. Um, yeah, so um, I'm going to bring up this paper that I wrote with some collaborators here at Microsoft. Let me bring it across here. So we took a look at um, different private synthetic data, um, state of the art methods. We did some evaluation, so you can totally check this out if you're interested. Um, it's a broad overview on the mechanisms that actually ensure differential privacy, as well as the way you integrate them with synthetic data methods. We also present our own method called Quail, um, which helps with generating different synthetic data that is specifically for model training. Um, so yeah, if you're interested, check that out. We'll share the link. Um, and I've abbreviated some of the learnings from the paper on this slide. So um, some of the things we learned is that, uh, as is often the case, um, there was no single data synthesizer that always performed best. Um, although some outperformed others in aggregate. Uh, and, you know, the GANs were um, pretty slow to train, while some of the histogram-based methods like MWAM were pretty fast. Um, we also discussed some metrics that you can use to assess the quality of your differentially private synthetic data, um, because it's, it can be quite tricky uh, to do so. Um, and we present on some of the learnings with Quail, which, um, can really help with the specific scenario that I'm describing here. Um, so let me briefly touch on this um, example that I'll show with part of my demo. Um, so here's the original data set, uh, which is sort of a fake data set. You can see it's actually quite a challenging classification example, 100,000 records, seven features, um, 10 balanced classification, and then there's some noise in there. So 3% of it is mislabeled. Um, Great. And you can actually go online and take a look at the notebook yourself. So Smart Noise GitHub, which we'll share out as a link. Um, here is the notebook where we actually do training and we show a few examples. Um, we train on the original data set uh, and show what just sort of no differential privacy does. Um, so we get uh, a score of 97 you know, 97% accuracy. Um, and that makes sense because 3% of the um, data points are mislabeled. And then we do differentially private um, training using um, an IBM library actually. Um, and we present the results there. So we see 89% um, accuracy and 72% accuracy. And then we generate a synthetic data set using some smart noise tools and we get an accuracy of 90%. Um, yeah, so just to put those numbers up on the slide. So you can see in this specific scenario, um, the synthetic data set with a random forest model trained on it actually outperformed the direct learning um, differentially private logistic regression classifier. So um, this is a scenario where you actually get a bit of a boost where you may reduce overfitting um, by generating that different private synthetic set, and then just taking whatever model you want, in this case, random forest model, and training on top of that. 
you still have that differential privacy guarantee, um, which is pretty cool. Um, I also have in the paper um, a bunch of different benchmark results on you know real world data set as, as long as well as a few internal Microsoft data sets that I can't say too much about, but we present the results there. So if you're interested in this, you can go look at the paper some more. Um, and with that, I'll hand back to Andreas and see if I can answer some uh, more of your questions in the chat. Uh, Andreas, do you want to take over again? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, Lucas, there was one question. If we can share a little bit uh, more about the math behind um, the, the research. I guess there is um, some level of detail already in the paper. I'm not yeah. sure if you can, uh, if, if there is any way to share more about the mathematical yeah, background. Let me just, I'll just pull up because- I was also interested to, you know, I, I, we have a fairly technical audience here. So if you wanna go over your paper and maybe even talk about the other GAN techniques you reviewed and also talk about Quail, mm -hmm. I would really appreciate that one too, because- uh, Yeah, so I'll just-, I'll just that that. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, I'll do that. And then if people have questions after Andres finishes up, we can- can dive more into. I figure, you know, it'd be remiss if we didn't put up the definition of differential privacy at some point in the presentation. So here it is. Here's the formal definition. Um, and whenever we're designing a differentially private mechanism, right, we want for the mechanism itself to satisfy this inequality. Um, and so I won't go through. I'll answer questions on this equation. I'm not going to try and um, go through that because that would require, I think, a little more time than we have. Um, but you can see here, this is our epsilon parameter that we tune. And this is actually what is um, known as the delta parameter, which provides a little bit of fudge factor depending on your mechanism, um, where you can adjust the bounds uh, for, so such that your, your proof satisfies this, um, this equation. And then let me just scroll through to some of the GAN architectures here in the appendix. Um, okay, so here's a proof of Quail's differential private guarantees, and then here's some of the GAN architectures. So the DPCT GAN model that is on smart noise um, actually adds the noise to ensure differential privacy in the discriminator network. And so it's you know a pretty traditional. It's actually the CT GAN architecture. If you're familiar with that. So pretty traditional GAN architecture, but modified in the discriminator net network um, using the Opacus library uh, to create different private synthetic data. And then um, PATE, PATE GAN, uh, or the PATE CT GAN model um, relies on the, the teacher student model of, um, which is PATE. Um, and I can talk a little bit more of that, although that might be outside of the scope of this presentation as well. Um, so it's just a different mechanism essentially for ensuring differential privacy in the synthetic data scenario. Um, okay, I'm, I am gonna hand it back to uh, Andreas so that we can uh, finish up the presentation though. So Andreas, do you wanna take over again? Yeah. So I guess you can see my screen again. We can see it, Andreas. Yeah. Perfect. So one of the questions that um, is you, you find uh, in the in the white paper again and again is uh, what's the impact, and maybe this also helps a little bit in uh, getting an impression about, or well, let's say, guidance. Uh, how to choose the epsilon parameter is what's the impact of accuracy um, uh, of differential privacy at, at various epsilon levels. So what we are um, seeing here is a set of experiments that we have done with the same data set. Uh, Lucas has used in the context of the uh, synthetic uh, example. Here we are using actually the IBM differential privacy um, uh, library. So th this is a differential privacy enabled uh, algorithm, uh, which is a uh, naive base uh, in this uh, context. And what we what we can see here 
is at various levels of epsilon and at, uh, also at various levels of the training size is the impact on accuracy. And if you uh, look at the results in a uh, setting without differential privacy, it is quite consistent with the level of, uh, uh, of an ep epsilon of eight. Um, the only exception is uh, this one. So if you don't use differential privacy, then this uh, accuracy level is higher. So the main uh, um, takeaway is really that you can control the amount of accuracy that you lose by differential privacy by carefully looking at the uh, choosing the epsilon parameters. Um, what we, uh, as Lucas mentioned, so practical examples um, uh, you can find here. So between 0 0.1, and also three, a one or three is a commonly used uh, parameter, but that depends on the use case. There are also some economic uh, approaches. Uh, if you, for example, if you can um, uh, relate the, uh, the, the use case to an risk. So there is a nice Harvard paper, for example, with an insurance use case uh, or a medical use case where they, uh, calculate based on the epsilon value, what would be the risk of an increase in the insurance, insurance premium based on various um, epsilon parameters. So there are also, there is a way to uh, even get an economic interpretation of the uh, epsilon parameter or at least uh, of its impact on expected uh, increase, increase of, um, uh, of an insurance premium in this case. So I think that this gives, an, gives a nice overview that you can compensate for the privacy uh, loss if you have a chance to add more training data. And that brings me to the final part. Um, the open question, of course, is what about deep learning? What we've seen so far had been classical uh, analytic use cases, univariate use cases, and also multivariate use cases with classical Machine learning question is about deep learning. And this is where obviously there is the biggest risk of memorizing uh, data points at, as we have discussed. And in the um, final demo and the final notebook, we leverage uh, relatively small medical data set uh, of only 5,000 uh, images. Um, so relatively small for deep learning standards. So you can also reproduce the demo uh, with the local equipment. We have uh, trained it here uh, in, in the Azure uh, cloud to, to leverage uh, uh, GPU instances, uh, larger GPU instances, but you should be able to reproduce the demo also based um, on a, a smaller equipment. And, and the way differential privacy works with deep learning is, um, it's relatively straightforward to include it in uh, your existing workflow. If you consider stochastic gradient descent, there are conceptually only a few adjustments to make stochastic gradient descent, which leverages randomness by default, hence the name stochastic, um, to, to add differential privacy um, to, the, to the mechanism. Um, one is to clip the gradient. Um, so gradients be can become in absolute terms very large. And in order to, uh, to reduce or to mask the sensitivity to specific data points, uh, the gradients are clipped. This is um, uh, change number one. And uh, the change number two compared to, let's say, classic stochastic gradient descent is that we then add noise to the clipped gradients. And the, the amount of clipping and also the amount of noise um, become additional hyperparameters. Uh, um, which you use in the context of differential privacy. And both uh, the extension for TensorFlow, but also the extension for PyTorch, which is called UpperCost, which we are using in our demo, uh, leverage this concept. And in particular for, for PyTorch, is, it's uh, relatively straightforward to include that. And what I would like to do is to actually uh, go through the, the notebook and um, show you how we are doing it in, in this 
a relatively simple example. So we are leveraging a public data set. It's a binary classification of X-ray images. So detecting pneumonia versus uh, normal, uh, which, uh, versus uh, X-rays which show normal condition. It's, uh, as I said, it's a public data set. Uh, which you can use. The advantage is it's relatively small, but uh, the uh, convergence behavior is quite good. So, and we are um, doing the usual stuff in uh, importing uh, PyTorch, importing Opacus, so the, the differential privacy extension for PyTorch. Then we acquire our data set. So we do not any uh, we do not leverage any kind of data augmentation. We just use the raw images, do some normalization, of course, but no augmentation, no, 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 no fancy stuff. Um, here you can see the, the images, so a couple of random examples, including normal condition and also including pneumonia. Um, then we um, design a relatively straightforward uh, CNN architecture, combining convolutional layers, max pooling layers, couple of uh, dropout um, uh, layers included, but so, so nothing fancy, uh, relatively basic, relatively straightforward. We are also not doing any kind of uh, transfer learning. And then we train the standard model without differential privacy that we have a baseline that we can compare especially uh, in particular for the for the performance metrics this achieves uh, um, after a couple of epochs quite a good um, accuracy quite a good validation accuracy and then uh, then we are testing based on the on the test set so we achieve 97 percent here. So it's a quite good model. And then here you can see the differential private version. Uh, it's, it's, it's not a big change. The only thing is we have to import the privacy engine of Opacus, so the extension for, uh, for PyTorch. Um, we attach it to the optimizer and we um, add those hyperparameters which are specific to differential uh, privacy for deep learning, which I mentioned. So the uh, the amount of uh, gradient clipping the, uh, and the noise multiplayer. And then there are a couple of other hyperparameters, but these are the, the important ones. And what you can see here is the training process. Uh, we adjusted the, 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 the training loop to, uh, to get uh, epsilon back per, per epoch. So we can decide after the training which model, which we, um, after which um, epoch we, we are using, because now um, not only we are looking at, uh, uh, at training loss and validation loss, we are also looking at the epsilon consumption per epoch. Um, the more often uh, you go through the data set, it's, it's the more privacy budget you are spending. And so this becomes also an aspect in deciding on the number of epochs um, is how much um, epsilon you, you want to spend. So th that's an additional consideration for the uh, deep learning process. And then we can see uh, the, the, the results of the, of the training. So classical parameters like training loss, validation loss, but also we can see uh, here in addition to that, the epsilon consumption, the privacy consumption. And if uh, overall we have an epsilon uh, a budget of let's say 10, then uh, we would um, stop here. But um, we can see that um, also considering the the loss um, values, the turning and validation loss, uh, it makes sense to do uh, um, early stopping, stopping earlier. And then we can see the results here. So we are losing a couple of percentage points in terms of accuracy. We will uh, compare that on the slide again. And um, yeah, I can also see, um, see the comparison in terms of receiver operating characteristics. Um, but I think it's probably easier to compare that here in, in this uh, slide. So we are, as I said, we are losing a couple of percentage points compared to the standard, to the non-private training. It's uh, in this example, it's four percentage points um, that we are losing, but um, still getting quite good results. Of course, uh, 
this depends on the use case. So if it's a, a very unbalanced uh, 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 data set, uh, the um, results will not be as good at uh, what we've achieved here. Uh, if you have more classes, of course, the world will be will also look a little bit different. Um, but um, I think it's a, a general uh, good way to, to start with differential privacy if you look at the example. And then there is, of course, always the question, what can we do to improve accuracy and privacy even further? Um, so the same um, observation that we had for the univariate analysis and also for the machine learning, um, the classic machine learning examples apply here. So more training data makes sense. Um, of course, reducing the, the network size and the complexity, which is generally a best practice to, uh, to avoid overfitting, in particular also applies to differential privacy. Hyperparameter tuning, you get two additional hyperparameters. Now we have in addition to the uh, to the usual set of hyperparameters, you get uh, gradient clipping and also the noise uh, multiplier as additional hyperparameters, but also the classic uh, hyperparameters like learning rate and also activation function have a specific impact on differential privacy. For example, there is some research that bounded activation functions like sigmoid may make more sense than the classic ReLU activation function. So um, it, it has some impact on um, classic hyperparameters as well, or uh, architecture considerations, even though that uh, we used uh, uh, ReLU activation functions in this example. And then of course, you can also combine differential privacy with transfer learning. So for example, if you have a public data set, like in, in this case, a, a medical data set, which has been trained without differential privacy, you can train uh, on top uh, of that uh, with differential privacy based for your specific use cases. So there are all kinds of options and variations which help to uh, improve the, the accuracy and the privacy even further. And the, the less epochs you need, the better it is from a privacy perspective because you spend less epsilon, so less of your privacy budget. And yeah, with that, um, I would like to conclude, if you want to learn more about differential privacy in machine learning, I definitely recommend uh, the, the white paper that we have published. Uh, there are also some very good books about differential privacy, like differential privacy and applications on the right hand side. I also uh, like the ethical uh, algorithm by Michael Kearns, which is more a, a general audience book. Uh, there are a couple of uh, recommendations that we have added here. And uh, in particular, if you really want to understand the background, also the scientific background, uh, behind Luca's work when it comes to the synthesizers, um, then uh, definitely um, it's worth to look at uh, the uh, the Lucas uh, to look at uh, Lucas paper. And if you want to try it out, here are a couple of links uh, for Open Differential Privacy, the initiative, but also for smart noise and also for uh, PyTorch upper course, there, is a, there are a lot of information, there are a lot of use cases and samples. So I think maybe to, to conclude, it has a very strong um, scientific foundation. It reaches more and more practical applications. And, and it's not all, only the, the big companies who have a lot of data like Microsoft, Apple, and Google. It's more and more enterprise customers who are looking into the concept, also combining it with other interesting and promising concepts like federated learning, for examples. I think one of kind of a moonshot um, application is the decision of the US uh, Census Bureau to um, provide the, the release, the results of the 2020 census also based on differential privacy um, it has not been released so far, but I think this will be also mean it give a big push for, for the um, technology. And yeah, as, as I mentioned, so the um, evaluation is that a differential privacy is the, or at least the upcoming gold standard for privacy protection. So it's definitely worth to, uh, to look at the developments of this technology. Yeah, maybe Lucas, is there something you would like 
to add. We have a couple of minutes to answer questions and also if there is maybe interest to go a little bit more into your, uh, into the, the paper, into your work. Uh, yeah, nothing to add. Um, happy to answer more questions uh, at this point. Yeah, I think the we have, a, we have a thriving discussion board, and thanks, Lucas, for uh, you know parallelly answering questions as Andreas was speaking. This was very best, insightful, yeah. um, and uh, we will be posting some of the links you have shared with us, both the papers and also the slides uh, to the audience, so that people can follow up. Now, I actually had a question. So this this is all fascinating result. Uh, you know, uh, things you've been working on. Now, from a pragmatic perspective, you know, if you're thinking about a bank or if you're thinking about a healthcare organization and um, or even the government, right? So there are a lot of you know defense and uh, you know government use cases wherein um, this is uh, going to be extremely useful. Now, with respect to the roadmap, where are you seeing you know the the progression? You know, you have also talked about the IBM's efforts in this and also Harvard's efforts in this. So how, how do you see the roadmap for Microsoft and what you are building in terms of tooling? Is it, is it more in the context of evangelizing it or are you thinking more package solutions to differentiate differential privacy as a service kind of a notion or how do you see the roadmap for mm -hmm. enterprises to adopt this whole workflow and mm -hmm. um, process? <clears throat> Yeah, maybe let me uh, uh, try to address the question uh, on a high level and maybe Lucas, you can uh, give then more details about the smart noise roadmap and, and specific uh, about the synthesizers. So I think uh, in, in general, uh, that, but that's my personal impression is that uh, differential privacy will probably become more uh, a standard for privacy protection, maybe to the same extent that we uh, uh, today protect um, data based on anonymization. So um, the concept is relatively new. I think the first public uh, publication was 2006 by Cynthia Dwork. So it's a relatively new concept has a strong um, scientific foundation. And now, you know, the big uh, companies started like, um, uh, like uh, Apple, Google, and, and Microsoft. Now it has already been more and more applied also in, let's say, non-technical non, uh, enterprises. So for Microsoft, um, I think um, the, the, the trend that we already started is that we leverage itself for our uh, in, in our technologies everywhere where uh, privacy preserving is important, like diagnostic data. This will continue, so it will will be included uh, and definitely in, in our products, but also in our offerings. So um, the uh, the the work that we are doing with Howard, with the community, this will go on. Um, and it would also be included in the uh, Azure machine learning um, platform. So we typically um, start with open, with open source uh, initiatives, but as for the other frameworks like um, FairLearn or, or InterpretML for fairness and for interpretability, it also comes uh, into the machine learning platform. I cannot make any commitment for, for smart noise, but it, I think it would make sense to also include it to our, let's say, commercial machine learning platform where we also start, uh, we all, um, generally we start with the open source work. And um, I don't know, Lucas, if there is anything you can talk about uh, roadmap wise for smart noise or for the synthesizers? Um, beyond the early adopter program, I don't think there's anything else I can say particularly, except that, um, you know, I think one of the main goals is for um, customers and just generally data owners to ask for differential privacy or as, as a privacy guarantee when handling their data. So you go to a machine learning practitioner and you say, I have this data, can you do some data, data analytics on it? I would like for those analytics to be differentially private for these reasons. Um, and I think you'll see that come to the fold uh, in the next few years uh, more and more. So, it's, you know, smart noises and, and similar efforts are just a way to provide toolings to people where those toolings don't exist with, you know, 
tried to lift the abstraction off of the uh, off of the scholarly literature and into um, people's hands, um, and and to make it open source so people can you know look under the the hood and see how the model is actually um, providing these assurances, um, because you know fundamentally um, adding noise according to um, you know these these definitions or these these mechanism proofs isn't you know it's not too crazy you know most people can understand it at the very least the intuition behind it and so that's important that's an important step to getting adoption yeah absolutely um i actually had another sort of follow-up question so we do a lot of work in um you know this notion of auditing models right so and when you audit models uh, you look at the whole pipeline you know you look at the data which was used to train these models yeah. And when it comes from a third party auditor's perspective, uh, data sharing becomes an issue. And especially if you're working with private data sets. Now, have you done any work in terms of replicability wherein you know, the data was trained locally with real data, but when it comes to you know, giving it to a third party, you wanna be able to replicate, but there potentially leverage you know, differential privacy and create synthetic data sets, but have the same kind of paradigm um, so I'm wondering from a replicability perspective, comparing and contrasting, uh, you know, for training, have you done any work on that area? And is this going to be a potential solution there? So do you, do you mean you've, you've done some model training or data analytics on the original data, and then you mm -hmm. want to share it with the third party without, you know, compromising anybody's personal information? Mm -hmm. Yes, this is a very common scenario. Um, and I think that uh, one of the questions I received in the chat sort of touched on this and on my answer, which is to say that um, some differential, it, it, it's scenario dependent, but there are existing differential, differentially private mechanisms that will give you um, comparable, if not match the performance you saw on your, you know, whatever your local machine or your local system on that third party system without compromising person's data. But um, you will see usually some amount of loss. You know, there's some cost to that privacy. Mm -hmm. um, and it just varies so widely, it's sort of hard to um, speak to. Um, mm -hmm. Now, there, we, we did present some and there are some tools that um, are pretty robust to a number of different scenarios. Um, so uh, yeah, I think this is where this, the data synthesizer is coming because if, if you can create a, a synthetic data set that has, you know, aggregate utility and you can just share that one off with a third party, you know, without having to focus on specific, you know, differentially private classifiers or models that you, um, that you feel will, that you then have to walk your, you know, third party through. If you can just share the data one off and say, here, use this and it's good, then um, that sort of green lights a bunch of scenarios that, uh, that are common um, without, you know, the sort of hand-holding we currently have to do with um, differentially private classifiers and, and specific tuning and whatnot, yeah. Okay, cool. And um, what are your thoughts on approaches for temporal data sets? I'm not hugely familiar with the literature on this. Um, you know, lots of, lots of differentially private models could be trained with temporal data. Um, specific to that, I, I don't. I don't think I have enough background to say anything interesting. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, I think there are a couple of questions on the web. So, where can we see a definition of private differential privacy? Well, Andreas did share his white paper and also textbooks and a couple of sources. So, I think that's probably the answer. Um, and the um, final product of your implementation of differential privacy, I believe, you know, some of the links we posted earlier should give you some references out there. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll link the, the, the book that Cynthia Dwork wrote, which is open source. And it's, it's a very good, it's a textbook. It's very good. So I'll just drop that in the chat as well. Okay, cool. Awesome. Um, so it's exactly one o'clock, um, unless there are specific questions. Uh, I think we'll take one last question from John Starr. Um, what am I missing with X-ray? diagnosis, how is it possible to justify any loss of accuracy? Even 97% uh, accuracy is not ideal. Um, so I guess it's a skeptic question. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I think uh, it's really uh, a question of uh, perspective. 
if mm -hmm. you already have a data set um, to motivate a, a data scientist to um, do differential private training and obviously losing accuracy, I think the, the, the motivation is not very high, but I think that that's not really the story. The story is um, that differential privacy, if you consider it end to end, will enable use cases that you currently cannot do because you have not access, you get not access to the data set at all. Um, so it, it, I would more consider uh, use cases that you cannot do currently because the data owner is not willing to share the data. But if you can give a guarantee based on differential privacy that there is no risk um, or almost no risk um, uh, if you can use the data for research purposes, for example, then this opens a door that you can use it at all. Um, or uh, another alternative could be that the data owner requests um, the data anonymization um, uh, because uh, he or she is, is concerned. So it's, it's really a, qu a question um, um, what the scenario is. If, if you have a data set and uh, nobody is concerned about the data, then you will probably not use differential privacy because then you just see the, uh, the impact on utility. But um, I would really more uh, think of it as uh, scenarios that are enabled um, because the data owner is not willing to, to share any data uh, if there is no formal guarantee. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you so much. This was a very enlightening and a very fascinating discussion. And I appreciate all the rigor which went into putting together this workshop. I um, again thank Andreas and Lucas for taking time of their busy schedules and presenting at the Quant University Spring School. And uh, we will follow up if there are any questions. I know there were a couple of questions and Andreas and Lucas, they both are on LinkedIn. So please feel free to reach out to them. And for people who are attending, the next workshop is going to be next Tuesday at 12 o'clock. And uh, what the theme we are taking is uh, AI regulation in the United States. So as some of you are familiar, uh, a few weeks ago, um, five federal agencies in the United States have put together a request for information about AI regulation in the United States. And there is a lot of discussion about what AI regulation should look like with all the technology progress out there. And uh, we have invited people from multiple spectrums to be part of this discussion. As I mentioned, uh, Nick and uh, Patrick are coming from uh, an advisory and a subject matter expertise perspective, but also from a legal perspective. Agu Sujanto from Wells Fargo is coming primarily from a bank's perspective, wherein they are looking at pragmatic way of you know, using various tooling when they provide products to their customers. Uh, Tulsi is uh, at Google and she comes from a technology vendor's perspective as they're putting together infrastructure from various things. And I'm coming from a part academic, part you know, discussion starter perspective. So we're going to have a fascinating discussion next week at uh, 12 o'clock. So I hope you can all join us and uh, thank you again for your time. And I look forward to connecting with you again online and continue the discussion there. Thanks again, Andrea. Thanks for having us. Thank Thanks you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.